بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah, the merciful, the compassionate, all praises to Allah, the creator of the universes and their sustainer, the provider of believers and unbelievers. And may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets, the last of his messengers and his holy progeny. And in particular, may his incessant blessings ever flow on that beloved daughter of the holy prophet, on Fatima to Zahra, salamullahi alayha. Before we continue with today's um, agenda, may I once again request you, as I have been requested to do, to attend to the to the uh, provision made for testing for thalab, for, for thalamia, a very important uh, measure being taken in order to assist the community, a process, although totally unconnected with AIDS or with HIV, nothing to do with those, uh, of course, but a, a, a disease which in itself is dangerous and the community needs to be spared of it. May Allah reward those who are taking part in helping the community spare itself of it and we have a duty therefore to respond to that generous offer from them. I propose this evening to spend just a few more minutes on matters left over from yesterday because it has been brought to my attention that some quite important matters were brought over to deal first with a matter just brought to my attention was that in what dress then did Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam attend to her marriage? The wedding dress was given away to that poor man. So did she go into that into that marriage procession in the same dress with patches that she was left with and indeed this is what she was determined to do but Allah in his mercy did not allow that situation to prevail because the 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 ceremony the caravan was going to be a caravan of outstanding merit and when she reaches there there would be ladies from all over the place and hence Allah at the last minute sent down an angel with a wedding a wedding cloak and a wedding a wedding dress and we befall him to Zahra alayhi salam was in fact clothed in that new wedding cloak from heaven and her her, her wedding procession proceeded with her dressed in heavenly clothes and indeed one finds that Allah has taken measures at appropriate times to to maintain the dignity of Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam because it is well said by well said I mean well reportedly said by the Holy Prophet and Aima alayhi salam that he who takes a step entirely for the pleasure of Allah Allah looks after his dignity Allah protects his, his reputation and prestige. It is said she was invited for a special ceremony amongst the Jews. And she complained to her father saying, Oh father, I am not, I do not have a suitable dress to wear for this occasion. And hence I am only going in the dress in which I have. And the Holy Prophet asked her, Oh Fatima, what do you think of this? She said, my reputation cannot lie in what dress I wear and I'm quite happy to go in the dress I am. And the Holy Prophet said, go ahead. Soon before she leaves, an angel comes down with a dress 
which she wore on that occasion amongst the Jews, which the Jews were astounded to see, would they not? Because with all their wealth, with all that they would provide themselves, they could only have provided with themselves with earthly dresses. Here was one provided from heaven. But one finds that in her life, such incidents occur repeatedly. We saw how food came. We have seen how dress comes. How does all this come about? And the answer to it appears to be her deep sincerity in her worship of Allah. That appears to be the answer to it all. Because the, the, the sincerity and the, the, the saintliness with which Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam worshipped Allah is an example by itself. The reason amongst the ladies uh, a parallel to it because this is exactly how exactly how she lived all through her life indeed it is said of her as much as it is said of Hazrat Amir alayhi salam that she would be in prayer all night from dusk to dawn she would be on the prayer mat worshipping Allah in, a, in, a, in an incessant manner one wondered from where came that spirit because it is not only physical presence that we are talking about. We are talking about a, con a degree of concentration that made one feel that she was away from this world. It is said of her, as it is said of Hazrat Amir and of Aima alayhi salam, that she would be shaking when making wudu. It is well reported in the ahadith that that would be her condition. And indeed, we get it from Aima alayhi salam, in particular Imam Hassan alayhi salam, that when she would be in mahrab praying, they would see her shaking out of fear of Allah. Indeed, one hadith reported in Sunnah source, um, Kanzul Umal says that when she would be saying her prayers, it would appear that she is lost altogether. And indeed, when this is reported to to the Holy Prophet, the Holy, uh, Holy Prophet is reported to have said in answer that yes, that is the state of Fatima. She is not in this world. She is so concentrating with Allah, she feels it is unbecoming. Look at the level of her, of her uh, spirituality. It is unbecoming of her when she is standing near in front of Allah, that her concentration should be away from Allah even for a second. The concept itself is easy to understand. When, for example, a clerk is called by the boss in, into his office for a questioning. How does he? How does he behave? Isn't his concentration glued on what the boss says, on each word uttered? What is required by the boss? What his? What? How should his response be? And in, in what words should that response be couched? Should it be couched in manner in which would please the the employer? So. To Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, it is easy to understand. She would say, I am before my Lord. How is it going to be acceptable to my Lord? Who knows where my attention is? Who knows the inner secrets of my brain? As much as it is said by of Allah, Ya'labu ma fi sudur, that, she, that Allah knows what is hidden in our chests. So does He know what is hidden in our minds? And if the minds concentrate, and if one knows that Allah knows what is in our minds, and yet the mind's concentration is not to Him who knows where we are and whom we claim to worship, how would that be acceptable to Allah? So the concept is easy to understand. It is practice of that concept that 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 requires our true test. But that is where Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam excelled excelled in being able to stand in worship. It appears, might I wish to say, and this is why I came back to this subject having not had the time to mention it last night and having regarded it sufficiently important not to pass over it as I have passed over other subjects. It appears, my dear youths, that there is no way out of spending time on the prayer mat. It is easy to say, what does this produce? The work done for Thalamia, 
for humanity is, is, is of course, admirable. Helping a poor person, of course, is of greater significance. And the youth tends to think that if those kinds of good acts are done, and may I say that those kinds of good acts are even done by kafirs, perhaps more of that kind of good is done by kafirs than they are done by mu'min. So that proves that the buck cannot stop there. But the argument is that if we do all that good and we say our prayers, 17 rakat every day in time, and we keep our fast, is that not enough? Yes, indeed. It may be enough for the purposes of accountability. It is not enough to get a status, to rise above. Put it in your language and say that it may be enough to get your passing marks. Yes, it will not give you even a lower second. So if that is what we are aspiring for, a lower second or a higher second, of course, even aiming at the sky, we may not aim for the first class. But even if we aim at those levels to be before in the eyes of Allah, then a little more is needed. And that little more has got to come by way of worship. Well, in practical world, in our world, world of professional life, world of uh, business life, how does one then go about it? And the answer appears to be the time at Fajr. That it is said is the best time for prayer. Indeed, the household of the Holy Prophet was never asleep then. That perhaps is the time when, when the world is asleep and the mind is fresh from having had some sleep to be up at that time. To start perhaps with namaz e shab namaz e tahajjud as the first step. I am not counting it as the last step. As the first step and move on from there. Some more time spent in prayer. Some more time spent in remembrance of Allah. He says in Quran, Walidhikrullahi Akbar. It is the remembrance of the ayah really starts with, uh, and perhaps I ought to do that, starts with, with the ayah on Quran. As-salah tanha anil fahashai wal munkar. Walidhikrullahi Akbar. It says, Salah is the one that separates you from fahashai wal munkar, from indecencies and from what is prohibited. And the youth says, oh, but I've been praying all this time, but I haven't got out of my, out of my uh, certain bad habit. The answer to that is, persist in your namaz and you will come out. The Holy Prophet was asked that question by a Bedouin. He comes to the Holy Prophet and says, I've, uh, I've read this ayah and I do say my namaz, salah. And the Holy Prophet says, yes, don't reveal your secret any further. I am aware of it. Keep on with your salah and you will see that salah does, does separate you from that evil sooner. How soon it will happen is a matter you have got to decide. That it will happen is sure to happen because Quran has said so. How quickly it happens depends upon how quickly you want it to occur. One can take a dip into a bath and come out as dirty as one was. So one has to wash oneself. Being in the bath is not itself the answer to it. But having said about, about salah, Allah sums that situation up by saying, Wali dhikrullah akbar and the best form, the best form of life is one in which there is remembrance of Allah. And it is that remembrance. There may not be time during the day. I, I realize that too well. But that little time made when we say we will do nothing but remember Allah, worship Him, seek His forgiveness and seek nearness to Him. That is what uplifts us. And is best taught by Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Not a lady who had much time, but whenever you hear of her, you hear of her in prayer. We have seen examples of how Bread, loaves of bread were given. She is back to the prayer mat. The Holy Prophet comes to meet her. She is on a prayer mat. Just before her, her martyrdom, she says to Asma, Oh Asma, I am going to pray. I am going just to spend time with my Lord. That is what we need to learn. To devote that time. I am not saying as much time as she devoted. 
uh, I appreciate we have to catch you to catch means of transport and get to work, but to let it even be 15 minutes, let it even be those 20 minutes to start with that period then will by itself increase because Allah grants more tawfiq to those who take to take the first step themselves. Indeed, with Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, Imam Hasad alayhi salam says that she combines two virtues in one. And this is the glory of that lady. Imam Hasan alayhi salam said that one night I decided I will sit and listen to what my mother is praying. What does she do? And he, and he did spend the whole night just sitting behind her mother, listening to the various du'as she recited, to the various namaz that she recited. And Imam Hassan salam said, the whole night, whenever occasion arose, she would pray for individuals also. So and so is sick, O oh Allah, make him well. So and so's child is sick, give him good health. So and so is indebted, let his indebtedness be cured. My neighbor is complaining of such and such a problem. Let that problem of his be solved. Name after name, person after person, until dawn cracks. Imam Hassan alayhi salam said, when my mother prepared herself for the Adhan, for Fajr, I went and held her shoulder and said, Mother, I heard you all night praying for everybody. You didn't have one prayer for yourself. When you two are not well, you had no one prayer for me too. How is this? How, how do you explain this to me? And the answer Bibi Fatima to Zahra gave has become a simile, not only in Islamic history, not only for a muallim to say in their madrasas, but has become a simile in Arabic literature. Talk to a Christian driver in an Arab, Arab country, he knows this as much as a Muslim. The answer she gave was a jar qabla dar. How simple and how short it means the neighbor must take precedence between those in the household. These are all neighbors that I remembered and I have a duty to remember. These are all neighbors who must take precedence over those in my household. I had to pray for them first. If the dawn cracked, so be it. Another opportunity to pray for people in the household, but they must take precedence. That, that spirit of doing good to others, praying for others, is such an important thing. We too can achieve prayers from Baby Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. I have been keen to learn how to achieve this for myself. And I would like to share that experience with you. One, rather that research with you, that experience. Of course, we all experience how she comes to help. One is a matter I set out last night. Maybe not as important in, in, Bum, in Mumbai as in other parts of India. When we are in problems, when we, are, we have trouble, we normally would go to a person who we know helps people in trouble. I'm sure you in this city, as people in various cities know, that Mr. X will help if you want a job. Mr. Y will help if you are in financial need. These people are known and Allah makes their names known so that Mu'mineen can be helped in that way. Likewise, we know that when we are in need of prayer, when we are in need of difficulties, Fatima to Zahra salam is the lady to help. And she is always there to help. One method of getting to her, I suggested yesterday, are the words taught by uh, Sheikh Abbas Kummi in Muntah al-Amal. He says, we invoke her by those words, Ya Mawlati, Ya Sayyidati, Ya Fatima Zahra, Aghithini. Yes, different different versions of doing it 50 times 70 times whatever the version the important thing is to get to her but she says and this is reported uh, at her behest that she was asked indeed it is it is Anas bin Malik who asked went to the to the house of uh, Bibi Fatima to Zahra one morning 
knocks at the door and Bibi Fatima to Zahra opens the door and says, Anas, what brings you here? And he says, O oh daughter, O oh beloved daughter of the Holy Prophet, only one thing brings me here. I've only come to ask for your blessings. And uh, Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam immediately says, Anas, may Allah bless you. Anna says, Ya Fatima, tell me what is the way to obtain blessings of, uh, of uh, your father and yourself. She says, the way to obtain blessings of my father and myself is to salute him. Or for that matter, to, to, to get my blessings, to salute me three consecutive days. If you salute me for three consecutive days, you are assured of my prayer for your blessings. That is the answer then. We have got it. Three consecutive days we must recite the ziyara of Bibi Fatima to Zahra. It does not have to be the one page long ziyara. It does not have to be that. It has to be the ziyara with sincerity. The ziyara that knocks her door in, in Medina, wherever she might be in Medina. Whether in Baqi, whether in Masjid al-Nabawi, those words, Assalamu alaikum ya Fatima to Zahra, those are the words that are enough to get to her. But the important thing, as I said, the first night when we started to develop that attachment with Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, that attachment in this world will last through the hereafter. When we will need that attachment even more than we need it today. But today we need that attachment even more because the world is changing. The times are changing. Times in which the enemies of Ahl al-Bayt are gaining strength and they're growing from strength to strength. We have to grow from strength to strength. If we do not have the capacity to grow externally, we surely have the capacity to grow internally and spiritually. And that attachment with Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam is which which is is what will keep us on track and indeed indeed coming back to anas and indeed that ziyara of that ziyara of hers is the same rule applies when we are in medina three consecutive days we need to stay in medina but it can start with an afternoon one day full day the second day it can finish with a ziyara on the third day in the morning so it does not have to be three full days. But that, but that panacea that she has taught can, can best be applied when we are there. And alhamdulillah, we are there during Hajj. We are there during Umrah. Because the, the companion went further on and asked her, Ya Fatima to Zahra, I am grateful for this teaching. Does this question of making salam to you and to your father apply when you are both alive? She says, no, it certainly applies that you greet us three consecutive days when we are alive, but it is as applicable even after our martyrdom. For they are alive. Do not even think, do not even conceive, Allah says, that those who have died in the path of Allah are dead. Nay, they are alive. Was it not enough for Allah to say, don't conceive of them to be dead? He repeats, nay, they are alive. And he is, though that was not enough, goes further and says, and they obtain their sustenance, their rizq from their Lord, even in the state in which they are. So that is the way we can continue to obtain her attachment and to continue to obtain the, the, the good that we want to obtain from her. For she is a reservoir of good and good continues to flow from her. It is an irony of history, but perhaps in keeping with the twist of history, that she was perhaps the most ill-treated person in the world for various reasons, for various reasons. But those reasons are not what will occupy my time tonight. The substance of the claim is more important because again, we are being criticized on that score too. So let us look at it. And that is the question of Fadak. I have thought about it pretty deeply and I hope tonight, in a few minutes, I will summarize the question of Fadak to you in a matter 
that will come forth as a very simple, in, in very simple historical aspect. What was it? Why was it taken away from her? And what are, what are the arguments that we put forward? Indeed, we borrow those arguments from Bibi Fatima alayha salam herself. What are the arguments to show that she was unjustly treated? And what is the importance of Fadak? The importance of Fadak, of course, is to start with that the people who were seizing authority and depriving Ahlul Bayt of authority were proving to the world through Fadak. Fadak was that object that was tangible. And through taking away that tangible object, they were proving to the entire world that the purpose was to take away anything that Ahlul Bayt got so that no authority can be vested in Ahlul Bayt in this world. What was Fadak then? Vast piece of land, plantation, that belonged to the Jews. When the Holy Prophet fought with the Jews in Khaybar, and we have discussed this already a couple of years ago, how Khaybar was very important, how it was the citadel of the Jews, how the Jews were concentrated there. The, the Banu Kunain and, and, and the others whom the Holy Prophet had defeated had concentrated in Khaybar, so they had made it a stronghold of the Jews. When they found after the fort collapsed and got into the hands of the Muslims that they could not survive, they made peace with the Holy Prophet and gave away a large chunk of their land to the Holy Prophet in lieu of being allowed to remain within the Muslim commonwealth. The Holy Prophet accepted that land and that land then belonged to the Holy Prophet himself. It, it became his personal property. And so the Holy Prophet was able to do what he thought fit with it. Now that is the first proposition. As I said, I'm seeking to make it in a very, to present the matter in a very simple way. But the first proposition, therefore, although in an academic way, more suitable to the undergraduates than the, than the elders, but the elders know the history of Fadak and the reason behind it better than I do anyway. So it is not important whether I adopt their procedure. So the first question is that when that piece of land was given away to the Prophet, it became property at his disposal. He could do what he liked. It was not like booty, which was distributed according to the rules of Anfal. We have discussed the rules of Anfal two years ago when we discussed Hunayn. However, this did not fall under that category. This was land because it was given away in settlement. The Holy Prophet could dispose of it or deal with it as he liked. Now, what is the authority for this proposition? Are, are Shias making anything up? No. The answer to that is that the authority for that proposition is in the Holy Quran itself. And let me say quickly that because it is in the Holy Quran, there is no dispute amongst Muslims, except for the uninformed ones, those who come to the universities without knowing the subject matter and say, oh, but Fadak never belonged to the Holy Prophet. Well, they are uninformed. The reality of the matter is that if they did open their books, they would find that there is no dispute amongst the scholars of the Muslim world that this was land that was not regarded as land that was obtained out of a battle. If it was land obtained after a battle, it is booty and has to be governed by those rules. But if it is not without land, and the, the authority for this, let me say straight away, is Surah Al-Hashr, chapter 59, verses 6 and 7. And those verses clearly say that if property is, becomes vested in the Holy Prophet, if the Holy Prophet acquires property from non-Muslims without having marched on them, without having used cavalry or camelry, then that property is within the sole jurisdiction, within the sole discretion of the Holy Prophet himself. Yusallata Rasulahu ala man yasha wallahu ala kulli shayin qadir. Allah has given authority to his, uh, his messengers in respect of the, these properties on whomsoever they, they please. They can give the property therefore to whomsoever this they please. 
This ayah is well, well discussed in Sunnite sources. And the source I, I, I rely on and commend you is the commentary by, by, by Sayyuti and also his, uh, his, his indeed, his um, commentary in Durr al-Mansur in volume 4 in respect of this particular ayah. Well, so the property becomes vested in the Holy Prophet. Before the Holy Prophet decided what to do with it, as always, he would wait for command of Allah. He did not want to end, and Allah in Quran says this clearly, that you do not act except on my pleasure. وَمَا تَشَاءُونَ إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ Allah. You do not wish anything except that which I wish. So he waits for command of Allah. And Allah's command comes to him at a time when this verse is revealed. This is chapter 17, verse 26 in Surah Bani Israel, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, In the commentary to that ayah, Sayyuti, again, a leading top Sunnite commentator, dealing with the matter in his tafsir, in volume 4 at page 177 says that when this ayah was revealed وَآتِي ذِي الْقُرْبَى حَقَّهُ and give to the next of, to, to the nearest of kin their right give to the next of kin his or her right the holy prophet paused and wanted to be sure what next of kin Allah is talking about and what is this right that is being mentioned and Jibreel descended, according to Sayyuti, and ordered that Fadak that was just given to the Holy Prophet by the Jews be given to Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. So on these two premises, that it was property within his discretion, and that he gave it as commanded by Allah, the matter is well decided on all authorities. Apart from Suyuti, one finds that other Sunnite commentators have taken exactly that line. One finds Sa'labi says that in his in his tafsir. One finds Yanabiul Mawadda says exactly that in in uh, chapter 39 on page 119. One finds Haskani from his authorities and in his commentary takes exactly that line in Shawahid Tanzil and indeed. Abil Hadid takes exactly that line in his commentary on Nahjul Balagha in volume 16 at page 216. So you can see there is an abundance of Sunnite authority. I have not cited to you Allah Mahilli who has written on it or Sayyid Murtaba who has written on this on, on the subject. Working purely on Sunnite sources, there is near unanimity that the Holy Prophet gave this property to, to Bibi Fatima to Zahra after the revelation of that ayah وَآتِي ذِي الْقَرْبَى حَقَّهُ But after the martyrdom of the Holy Prophet Abu Bakr decided that that property should come into public hands Of course he couldn't have decided it should come into his hands so he, the political decision by politicians is that it should be in, in public hands, which would be controlled by him. And indeed, to execute that decision, he sent out his agents. Government agents entered the land. The agents appointed by Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam were removed from there and were replaced by government agents and authority taken over. Might I, might I, interpose another thought for you at this stage for the fear that the clock keeps moving still worse even nights keep moving and we seem to be omitting subjects to discuss and then it appears it dawns that certain matters have not been discussed at all so lest that happens can I interpose this thought to you here I say to you that agents of Bibi Fatima to Zahra were removed from there Khaybar you know was 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 a, a matter of the sixth year after Hijrah. So if this property was given to Bibi Fatima to Zahra for a couple of years before the martyrdom of uh, the Holy Prophet, 
it would appear that she was reaping the fruits and she was getting the income from that property for that number of two or three years. What happened to that money, may I ask you? Because when we look to history, we find Imam Ali alayhi salam waking up after the birth of Hassanayn alayhi salam. That is at the time Fadak was in the hands of Bibi Fatima to Zahra and saying, Fatima, is there any food? And she says, Abal Hassan, there is no food in the house. So where was this money going? Is there any escape from saying that all that must m money must have been distributed to the poor and the orphan of the Ummah of Islam before even it even reaches the hands of Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam? That is how that money was spent. Why should there have been a need for the government to take over, I ask, before we even discuss the details? Why should there have been need for administration by the state when those who had the administration of it and that was it alone Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam but when I say those when I couple perhaps that her husband had authority from her Imam Ali alayhi salam had authority to, to act in the matter Hasadayn alayhi salam of course were very small then if they manage property in that way in the welfare and interest of the ummah is this how the ummah was going to deal with the property tomorrow night inshallah we shall discuss that as to what exactly happened to fadak how it devolved from hands to hands how it even ha went into the hands of personal personal relatives of the caliphs khalifatul rashidun the well-guided caliphs their personal relatives were given chunks of fadak as personal property we will see to that we will discuss that inshallah tomorrow how marwan bin hakam got property for, got fadak from personal property why was it then seized from fatima to zahra alayhi salam because so long as it remained in in the hands of alul bayt the beneficiaries were never the ahlul bayt alayhi salam they were content to lead to, to lead lives on dry pieces of of bread and even to lead lives without without food to make sure that the poor were fed indeed when imam ali alayhi salam was asked during his khilafah that he said i do not want to spend one night of my life in a way in which my stomach is better filled than that of any poor person in the in the muslim ummah well if that was the standard that was maintained what was the justification of taking that piece of property from from the ahlul bayt given time i will venture to make suggestions you will be the judges yourselves as to whether those suggestions hold water however she takes that property and immediately she takes that property Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam moves into the court of Abu Bakr to lay her claim to that property. This is now action of an individual against the state. The, again, I'll interpose another thought for the youth. The Western world tells us today that woman was colonized by man. A woman had no place in life. And it is only the Western world that today has given woman her proper place i agree the western woman has removed the veil from the woman from the from the veil from the woman has enabled the woman to trot the streets even half naked if you came to the western world particularly in summer has given that liberty which islam would not give had allah has allowed them allow them a way of life which we muslims regard as indecent but let them not say that they allowed women the right to property to own property and to sue if a wrong is done to them because the right to own property fadak you can see was given to Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam who was a woman centuries ago in India woman a married woman had no right to hold property at all till today in classical Hindu law a married woman cannot hold property as an owner of it she can at the most have a life estate in that property which will revert to either her husband if she was married upon her death or to, it will revert to her parents it is the it is the the the, the uh, it is the indian married women's property act that gave women the right it is the hindu succession act indeed that first gave 
right to a Hindu woman even to succeed as an heir. This which Abu Bakr said to the to Bibi Fatima to Zahra that prophets are not are, on, are not inherited was the common rule that women could not inherit at all. It is the Hindu Succession Act passed by the Indian Parliament that enabled succession to take place. Of course, it was first passed at a time when India was still a colony. But leave India alone. Leave India alone. Because how far will they be prepared to respect India? In England, now this is the mother of nations. In England, a married woman could not hold property in her own right until 1882. What am I talking about? A hundred years ago? Until a hundred years ago, she couldn't until Married Women Act 1882 was passed. That for the first time gave a married woman right to hold property. Islam said centuries ago that a woman will hold property, she will inherit. If a husband dies, she will take mandatorily. Whether somebody likes it or not, one-eighth of that property. And if there are no children, one-fourth one of that property. If she's a mother, she will take one-sixth. If she is a daughter, she will have her own share. She could even take half the property. She can even inherit half the property if she is, a, if she is the, 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 uh, entitled by the, by the rates of uh, succession. Well, and indeed, in Islamic law, gave the right, and this is important what I'm saying, gave the right to a lady, married or unmarried, to receive gifts, gifts of movable property or immovable property, and hold it in her own right. And this happened centuries ago. And then it was said that if that woman then being married gives the right to her husband to receive rent from that property, the husband is accountable to the wife. And if she does not give a proper account of the rents he receives to her, she can go to the Hakim and get judgment against him. And indeed, this, this uh, ethos that's come up, that the Western world has given the opportunity to women to claim their rights and to go to court. One can see Bibi Fatima to Zahra going to court centuries ago in her own right. And she was not even she was not even suing an individual, she was suing the state. This concept of suing the state, we are told is a new thing. It is a new thing because they had stopped. They passed acts of parliament stopping the citizen from suing the government. Governments in power abused their authorities and refused to be sued. In the Islamic Commonwealth, from the beginning, the government could be sued. And you can see you can see Bibi Fatima to Zahra going to court to exercise that right, as it were to put a stamp on that right of a citizen, the freedom of the citizen to be able to challenge the state in such circumstances. Whether the citizen succeeds or not is a different matter in her khutbah that she delivered in the court of Abu Bakr. She said this very clearly, that I know very well that I am forsaken by you. She said that to Abu Bakr, I know very well you will not give me my right. Turns to the Ansar who were present in the court of Abu Bakr and says, Oh Ansar, you Hanas, you are people who are supposed to have helped my father. You are people who, have, who are supposed to have struggled with Islam. You were there in Ahad and Badr and, and uh, Hunayn and Hunay too, yes. And, 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 uh, and um, Hazab and all those. But I know today you have forsaken me. Because you have associated Allah, Ma'adullah, with other gods, know that doing so is deviating from the path of Islam. She said this to them in unmistakable words, and the entire Arabic text exists till today. I will not pretend that I will deal with any aspect of it in these sittings. Indeed, in one attempt that I have made to discuss that particular uh, speech, it has taken me. An unlearned person, I am totally unlearned in these things, it's taken me about six hours. I don't know what a learned person would take discussing that khutbah. So I will not even venture to pretend that I will discuss that khutbah, uh, either entirely or partially. Only to make the point that she knew too well that she was forsaken, and yet went to that court, 
for a number of reasons. One of those reasons, I dare say, was to establish this principle of human rights that the world is being proud of today. And she went to court and said to Abu Bakr, why have you seized my property? And Abu Bakr turns around to her and says, where is your evidence? Where is your evidence that this property is given to you? When, when uh, Abu Bakr finished with that aspect and did not give Fadak to be Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, Hazrat Amir alayhi salam approaches, approaches uh, uh, Abu Bakr and Tabrisi re uh, reports this in his, uh, in his Ihtijaj approaches Abu Bakr and says, Oh Abu Bakr, by what standards and on what basis have you deprived Fatima of Fadak? And he says evidence, and and uh, and, and uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam turns round to, to to Abu Bakr and says, Abu Bakr, what evidence were you looking for? Is it not enough that Fatima should come and say that my father has given this as a gift to me? Was there any Muslim to contradict that word of Fatima? Wouldn't Fatima have agreed to say that on oath? Because. Umm Ayman went with Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam to that court and swore that I was present when the Holy Prophet gave that property to her. But apart from that, Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam would be prepared to take an oath. Do you want an oath from her? Wasn't her word enough? She was Siddiqa as we have already decided. And indeed, Tabrasi says that on that occasion, Imam Ali alayhi salam cited that particular verse to, to him. Have you not read, O Abu Bakr, the ayah? Innama yuridu Allahu liyuzhiba ankum al-rijz ahlul bayt wa yutahhirakum tatahira. He says, yes, I have read that ayah, but I need proof. And Hazrat Amir alayhi salam says, what further proof I need? What other proof you need? Her statement, her claim is proof of her claim. That that is all that is required. Because if you wait for a Muslim to say anything contrary to what she says, then you deviate from the path of Allah. Because the testimony here, the testimony for Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, and let this be said openly even in universities today, that evidence for Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam in her claim for Fadak came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. If divinity gives evidence, what further evidence can any government require? But Hazrat Amir alayhi salam goes further and says, O oh Abu Bakr, four years before the Holy Prophet reached his martyrdom. Four years, income from Fadak was being received by Fatima to Zahra. Possession was with her. Control of the property was with her. Did anybody object then? Did the Holy Prophet say that she was doing so unlawfully? Was it then not known? Did you not know then that she had Fadak and was receiving, receiving uh, income from that property? Did anybody object? Isn't that possession, physical possession, itself evidence of proof? Tabrasi says, Abu Bakr did not want to proceed with the argument any further and remained quiet. One can understand. One can understand why he would remain quiet. These are unanswerable arguments. But Abu Bakr declines to give the property to, to Bibi Fatima to Zahra in the first place on that basis. Saying, saying that where is the proof? And, and embarrassing as it is to say today, Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam immediately brought forward Imam Ali alayhi salam as a witness. And Imam Ali alayhi salam got into the, in, in, into the court of Abu Bakr to testify of his own knowledge. So here they are, there are two members now. Indeed, Hassanayn alayhi salam were also brought. So out of the five the four living people under the Kisa were in court to, 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 to render that testimony. There is evidence that there need not always be two men to give evidence. Evidence of one man has been accepted by the Holy Prophet in a dispute regarding, in a, dispute regarding a horse. 
one person testified in the presence of the Holy Prophet and the Holy Prophet gave judgment in his favor on the basis of one witness only. And this is well reported in, for example, Faraidu Siptain in first volume at page 338, that one witness can testify on this particular point. Abu Dawood, one of the Sahih Siddha of the Sunni sources, has made note of this particular case in which the Holy Prophet said, I as a judge, having been satisfied with the evidence of one witness, do not have to wait for another witness. I will give judgment on the basis of that witness because truth has been established. And that, that matter in Abu Da'ud is in Sunan Abi Da'ud in volume 3 at page 480. Indeed, an oath and a witness have also been held to be sufficient as has been set out in the Sunnah source, Kanzul Amal, in volume 5 at page 508. And this was indeed a situation in which there would have been an oath available from uh, Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam and the evidence of Umm Ayman. If the evidence of, uh, of uh, Hazrat Abir alayhi salam, Ma'adullah nastajiru billah, was not accepted, acceptable to Abu Bakr. So one can see there was abundance of evidence to prove that, that gift. Evidence from witnesses, totally reliable, no evidence to contradict what they were saying, and evidence of previous possession during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet because the Holy Prophet did need to give possession. We are talking of immovable property. There is a difference in law, the evidence required between movable property and immovable property. But in even, the, even when one regards that this was immovable property, possession having been given, that was an important point in Muslim law. When that was not accepted, Bibi Fatima to Zahra pegged her case on another ground, says, Oh Abu Bakr, if you think this was not gifted to me, then it was the prophet of the it was the property of the Holy Prophet. Because this was not booty. If it was not booty and it was property voluntarily given to the Holy Prophet, it became his property under the ayah of Surah Hashr, verse number six that I just recited to you. So Abu Bakr says, Well, if that is so, it becomes the property of the Ummah. Maybe Fatma Dazara says, No, it is his property, and so I am an heir. <coughs> and I have no brother. So her share is, is, is enhanced. I am the heir. Give it to me as an heir. Abu Bakr says, I have heard the Holy Prophet say that we prophets neither inherit nor are we inherited. Our property is sadaqah. It is to go to the poor. Well, centuries later, we gathered here would say, we are more sure it was going to the poor when the property was not in the hands of the commonwealth than after it came into the hands of the commonwealth. And tomorrow we shall trace its history, inshallah. However, this is what he claimed. <coughs> and Bibi Fatima to Zahra, in her speech, in that khutbah that she delivered, contradicted that statement and said, where is the evidence of such a hadith? If one existed, I would have known. If one had existed, my husband Ali alayhi salam would have known. Such a hadith does not exist. Well, again, it is well known in jurisprudence that if the hadith is reported by one companion only, then it is not, it is not a hadith of substance. It is, it is raif, it is weak and it should not be acted upon. There must be support for that hadith from another, from another source. But be that as it may, Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam says, that hadith would be contrary to ayats of Quran. Look at Quran, haven't you studied Quran? Cited the ayah which says, وَوَرَثَ سُلَيْمَانَ Dawood And Sulaiman inherited Dawood. Now, both now are prophets. Sulaiman was a prophet. Dawood was a prophet. How does one inherit the other if such a hadith ever came true? Wahabli min ladunka waliya yarithuni wa yarathuni min wa yarithu min ali yaqub waj'alhu rabbi radiya. Those words are in Surah Maryam, verse 5. Words of, of a, a prophet Zakaria saying to saying to Allah, oh Allah, 
give me an heir. Wahabli min ladunka from yourself. Waliya, give me an heir. Who will inherit me? Yarithuni. So there we are. A prophet can be inherited. And not only me. Wa yarithu min ali Yaqub. Yaqub also is a prophet. Bibi Fatima the Zahra threw us strings of ayat from Quran to contradict that hadith. We need to spend no more time on it because if a hadith is contradicted by ayats of Quran, what basis can it possibly have? And when that did not succeed for reasons best known to Abu Bakr, then the third bag on which she presented her case was Khums. She says, O oh Abu Bakr, I am from the family of the Holy Prophet. Who could have denied that for God's sake? And she did even ask in that khutbah that I am Fatima, the Fatima we have discussed for those nights. The Fatima about whom the Holy Prophet says, Man adaha faqad adani, he who injures her has injured me. And in that particular khutbah, she has reminded the people of that. And indeed, Abu Bakr should have known better that harming her in that way was harming the Prophet. And harming the Prophet is harming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The consequences being the erasure of all a'mal as we have seen a couple of nights back from a Sunnite source. And you see why those foundations were necessary. Although we need to discuss them for our own knowledge and information anyway. But even khums of which she was entitled, she was deprived altogether. In that khutbah. Bibi Fatima to Zahra turns round and says to the Ansar, O oh Ansar, you were people who the Holy Prophet thought would help the Ahlul Bayt. Now, here is a time when I am seeking this help from you. I can appreciate that you are not in a mood to help me and you will forsake me for this purpose. Yet I come and make this speech to you, not because I want you to help me, but because I have to perform my hujjah, I have to. I have a duty to present these arguments to you. And I dare say that she did it entirely out of nobleness of her purpose. Time is passing and I shall revert to this tomorrow. What was her purpose in, in making that submission to them? But one can see Ahlul Bayt legitimately asking for help. Asking for help at a time when they were being ill-treated, being treated unjustly by enemies of Islam. Whenever that kind of help was sought by Ahlul Bayt, it was denied. Firstly, it is denied to Bibi Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam on this occasion again in Karbala when Imam Hussein alayhi salam turned around and said, Hal min nasirin yan suruna. Is there any helper who will help us on this occasion? Help did not come. Indeed, the role of Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala was in a way different. Like her mother, like his mother, she, he always said he was making that announcement to perform a hujjah, to present a proof. Otherwise, his companions he had gathered together. He put the lamp off and said, anybody who wants to go away is free to go away. These people are thirsty of my blood. They are not thirsty of your blood. Why do you want to shed your blood? You all go away. But proud has been Hussein and Hussein alone of his companions saying, who stood up and said, if we are killed 70 times and be reborn, we will again die in your cause, Ya Hussein. This was the loyalty of the companions of Hussein. But all glory to Habib ibn Mahdahir. Habib ibn Mahdahir was not in Karbala then. Imam Hussein alayhi salam writes a specific letter to him and calls him over saying, Ya Habib, I am surrounded by enemies. I need your help. Come over. I turn round this evening in this sitting in which Habib may be with us and turn round to him and say, Habib, Imam Hussein alayhi salam, he knew too well that your presence on that day will not save his life. He knew too well it will not save Ahlul Bayt. What an honor done to you, Ya Habib. What an honor done to you that you are today in the forefront of the companions of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. When we enter his Zari in Karbala, O oh, Habib, we salute you first. We salute you as Salaamu Alaikum Ya Habib ibn Fazahir before we go further. 
This is a great talent, a great honor for him, for Habib ibn Mazahir. He comes into, he comes into Karbala. Although he may have been and inspires all the other soldiers too. And when the time comes and he is to give his life, indeed he first sees Muslim ibn Ausaja going. And when Muslim ibn Ausaja goes, <laughs> Habib moves to the to, to the body of to the to, to the to the to, to, to Muslim and says, Muslim, I have a few more minutes in the world. Do you have any wasiya? Muslim says Look after that Rajul, that man, <laughs> naming Hussein, and even at that hour, Habib says, Oh Muslim, be sure I will have every tissue of my body cut out in order to protect Hussein Islam. And this is what he did what he did to the last minute. And even after that his head was paraded. History has it that Habib's son sees it in Kufa, turns round and says Assalamu alaikum. Zainab turns round and says to Imam Ali, Oh Ali, who is this person who is saluting Habib? Habib was a person she had saluted when Habib arrived in Karbala. Habib was then shaking, saying, Oh, the granddaughter of the Prophet saluting me. Now is the time when the role has changed, when Zainab asks, Imam Zainul Abidin, Oh Ali, who is saluting this head of Habib? And Imam Zainul Abidin says, Auntie Zainab, this is the, the orphan of Habib saluting. Bibi Zainab turns round to Imam Ali and says, Ya Ali, tell this orphan that my salams are to him also. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون رحم الله من يكر الفاتحة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين 